Hello and welcome. My name is Ilva Tara and this is Balkans Debrief. My guest, Paul Taylor, Senior Fellow for Peace, Security and Defense at the Brussels-based think tank Friends of Europe, has recently argued uh, that the European Union must speed up integration of the Western Balkans in order to prevent malign powers exploiting instability in the region. Paul, thank you for joining in us. Uh, what do you think? The recent summit in Tirana has been widely praised for reinvigorating the enlargement process. Will it be enough, in your opinion? Well, it depends what, what the follow-up is. I think there's been a tremendous amount of political attention uh, showered on the Western Balkans this year, uh, which is a real change for the EU for after a, what you might call a decade of neglect. Um, they've started negotiations finally uh, for entry into the EU with, with Albania and North Macedonia. They've held two summits plus a, an important conference in Berlin um, to revive the sort of regional economic integration, which itself is a preparation for integrating into the European Union. So there's a strong political attention there. People recognize, I think, that this is a geopolitical moment where uh, there's a, a new contest Uh, among the great powers over the Western Balkans and where Russia, if it can, will try to make things as hard as possible for the European Union, NATO and the West. Considering things as they are now, do you think that the European Union can politically provide clearer timelines uh, for the enlargement? Uh, what are the impediments? I think it's difficult to provide uh, clear timelines because so much depends on the reforms to be conducted Uh, in the countries that want to join the EU. And that's really what defines the timeline. It's a merit-based process. And however you uh, try and encourage countries, uh, you can't get around the fact that uh, unless they do their homework, uh, enlargement is not going to come anytime soon. Uh, and indeed, of the three countries that are in some ways um, in, in the best best performers on the Western Balkans, it's all rel relative. Uh, but if you look at uh, Montenegro, they have a political crisis there, which is causing uh, a certain amount of paralysis also in the judicial system uh, um, and no sort of political consensus about reform because the politics are so toxic. Um, and you have a pro-Russian, pro-Serbian party, which is uh, uh, playing a significant role, uh, although it's a minority party. That's an example. Uh, you look at Albania. Albania is making you know, big progress in terms of a complete clean out of its judiciary. Something like 60% of the judges who've been vetted have been uh, forced out. Uh, into retirement. But of course, before you get a completely new judicial system up and running, which is being done with support from the European Union and the United States, it takes a while. So at the moment, you're not yet seeing uh, that number of convictions of politicians and organized crime figures and so on. And North Macedonia, similar uh, situation. You've got a reformist government, but uh, there are huge problems with corruption. And they've got a sort of a time bomb waiting for them uh, in the sense that they have to change their uh, constitution next year in order to um, keep on track for the European Union membership. And they don't yet have a constitutional uh, supermajority in parliament to do that. Paul, but is the process really uh, meritocratic or mostly political in your view? <laughs> well, I mean, it's been very much a box ticking exercise so far. So I would say bureaucratic. Um, uh, it ought to be meritocratic. Um, but obviously, there's also a big political element to it. Um, and different countries have their favorites. Um, and some countries favor Serbia because it's big, because it, ha it has a third of uh, the population and almost half of the GDP of the region, uh, and because it's so much contested with Russia and China, um, and it's also close to some EU countries, such as Hungary. Um, and in some ways, I'm afraid it, it shares a bit of a political model uh, with Hungary, which is um, the kind of illiberal democracy that has become Uh, um, a problem for the European Union. Um, so, um, you know, there's a, there is a, always an element of politics. And, you know, especially now with the, with the Ukraine, uh, uh, the war going on in Ukraine, the question of whether countries align with the European Union and with the West uh, in joining uh, sanctions, uh, it, it has really become more important. It's a political question. 
um, and Serbia has not aligned with the sanctions. Uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina has aligned with the sanctions, but the Bosnian Serbs are actually making it impossible to implement the sanctions, nevertheless. Um, and the other countries have aligned with the sanctions. It's, cost, it's been painful for them, um, um, but they are, you know, it also makes them more vulnerable uh, because of their energy dependence. Is full EU membership even in the cards? Are we talking about some kind of membership minus arrangement for the new aspirants? Well, I think what we're talking about is from so, some sort of gradual progression where full membership will remain uh, on the horizon. Um, of course, the, the trouble with most horizons is that they never get any closer, as you know. Um, I think full membership w is still the objective. Um, I don't think either the countries themselves um, or the EU really want to settle um, for for less, but I think it'll take a long time. Therefore, it's important to create interim stages where the countries get rewards, get more political involvement in the EU, uh, and feel, therefore, uh, more belonging and more that their uh, reform efforts, when they make them, are recompensed. So I think that that's important. And the EU has to do more to adapt its process in order to provide for that step-by-step -step gradual integration of the Western Balkans. And in that regard, both the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and the French President Emmanuel Macron, they have warned that the European Union will have to undergo political reforms before it enlarges again. How likely is that to happen? Well, at the moment, it doesn't look very likely at all because you've got a combination of, of sort of the new members from Central Europe who feel that they don't want to be dictated to by a Franco-German dominated Europe and therefore their veto power is important to them. And then you've got a bunch of small countries, small member states of the EU, who for, historically, for one reason or another, whether it's because they have uh, special tax arrangements for business, low tax, uh, uh, low corporate tax that they want to prevent, protect against uh, other countries that want them to, to get rid of it, um, they have their reasons to want to keep a, a national veto as well. So you've actually got roughly half of the members of the EU who currently don't support getting rid of the veto. Things can change. The war is already changing people's outlook towards uh, making EU policy decisions more effective, more rapid. And the fact that one country, Hungary, is able to hold up major thing, major uh, financial or military uh, uh, support for Ukraine is widely seen as a problem. So it's widely seen as something that the EU needs to fix. They, they look for workarounds, but um, that may change the dynamic. But for the moment, I agree that uh, making uh, prior reform of EU decision-making a precondition before any new members can join uh, is pretty depressing as a prospect for the countries of the Western Balkans. So perhaps uh, removing unanimity may be the next step, one of the reforms that the EU will do? It, it's a possibility, you know, that you, you, at the moment people tell you that's impossible, don't even think about it, you know, there's too many countries against it. But uh, circumstances change and the EU is an organization which always finds the way to do, to take decisions when the circumstances require it. So it's possible that that, that may evolve, I, I believe. Uh, Paul, uh, you, you know the region, you, you have s spoken with uh, experts and uh, policymakers there. People tend to focus, especially in the region, a lot on the carrot of development funds and investments uh, to be given in exchange for implementing reforms. Uh, why have these uh, investments been less than transformative? And why have the reforms not materialized uh, quickly enough? How do we break that cycle? Yeah, if we compare it to the 1990s, in the 1990s, there was a wave of capital looking for places to invest and the new Central European uh, countries were, were a good bet. And so ma many of the foreign direct investments uh, in that region actually precede an enlargement. They came in because they knew these countries are going to join the EU and it will be a great place to invest. 
Um, at the moment, there is no such wave of capital looking for a home. There is no prospect that these countries are going to join the EU in a short enough time frame. Um, and their economies are also smaller. I mean, the whole Western Balkans, we're talking about 18 million people. The, 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 the economy of the whole Western Balkans is smaller than the economy of Slovakia. So um, it's partly that, 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 that that's not working. Plus, of course, the, the, the thing is that um, in, in, in many of these countries, not all, and there has been dem democratic alternation in power in, in, in some, but in many of these countries, essentially, the ethnic nationalist parties that were in control at the end of the Yugoslav wars of the 90s remain in control. Uh, and they run as a clientelist system where jobs, housing, various other things depend on uh, uh, the party or, or on being close to the ruling uh, uh, elite. Um, and those systems are very hard to shift. Um, and to dynamite those systems out, you need both pressure from above and pressure from below. The EU, I think, could be doing more to help support civil society and to support those groups that can provide pressure from below. That means youth. It means women. Uh, it means uh, small business. All of those are kind of and civil society groups um, that are uh, factors for change which the EU perhaps hasn't been doing enough to support. I was mostly referring actually to EU funds and investments uh, also. Uh, they seem that they are not as much as present as the region would want them well, to you're right. be. Well, you're right. You're right, Ilvan. There are two reasons for that. One is corruption and the fear that the EU funds uh, go in, would go into the wrong pockets. And therefore, there's uh, a real demand from Brussels to make sure that the money is uh, proper, properly spent. But the fact is that the EU enlargement process uh, gives you a trickle of pre-accession uh, funds until you join. And then the day you join, this gusher opens and you get uh, uh, showered with money, at almost uh, 4% of your gross domestic product. And, and many countries, in fact, have had it, found it hard to absorb that money. There's so much of it. So the idea must be to bring more of that money forward, to, to release more of that money while countries are still candidates so that they can actually use more of that. But to do that, you have to have uh, uh, you know, partners that you can trust. You have to be sure that the money is not going to go into the wrong pockets. And, and that's difficult in that region. Do you believe there is a political will from the regions, uh, the Balkans capitals, to properly combat corruption in a meaningful way that will convince Brussels to properly invest in, in the region? It's a very hard question to answer. I think that um, you have um, some countries, I, I, I named the three, I'll name them again, uh, Montenegro, Albania, uh, and North Macedonia, where you currently have forces in government, sometimes in minority government, um, that are really dedicated to trying to um, put their, set their countries on the European path. And uh, um, that means, obviously, fighting corruption as well. But, you know, it's very... Look at... Let's take Montenegro, a micro example, small country, less than a million population. Um, the president of Montenegro is somebody who was indicted in the past in or under investigation in Italy um, for um, um, running a major uh, cigarette smuggling racket. He was never prosecuted. He was never convicted. So all we can say is if you're dealing with com um, uh, a corruption uh, in Montenegro, you have a, a um, at least an issue in the president's office. Since we're talking about Montenegro, which went actually from front runner in the EU integration in the region at a political impasse that is currently uh, uh, stopping all the process, the EU process, the US government has spoken and they have called for general elections. What is the EU stance on the future, on the political future of Podgorica? I mean, I think the, the EU stance is that it helps countries' enlargement processes for there to be a political consensus on the issues around making the necessary reforms to join the EU, whatever else they may differ uh, uh, about. And so a country where there is so, diff so little political consensus is, is a worry for the EU. Um, uh, from people I talk to, I mean, the EU doesn't have an official line on whether countries should hold general elections or not. That's their internal business. But, um, you know, the people I've talked to in the, in, in, at EU headquarters are hoping 
that a there will be a political deal that will hold between the government and the opposition to name uh, people to the constitutional court and the supreme court so that the court system is able to function and then you have a general election because without um, getting the courts up and running you're going to have a general election the result of which is likely to be contested and you, on it goes we talked about this briefly, uh, Paul, about the process being uh, political as well as meritocratic. So after granting Ukraine and Moldova candidate status, looks like Bosnia is uh, on the line to be granted uh, candidate status. How can that move, uh, in your view, can that move be as a catalyst for change in the country? Well, you know, first of all, it, it, it should be a real morale boost for a country that has been um, you know, at the back of the queue, along with Kosovo, um, and Kosovo, incidentally, is hoping to put its application for EU membership in by the end of this year. But there are big problems there. We can talk about that later, if you like. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, I think that it would be uh, an opportunity to show that, that when they do reach a minimum of cooperation, there's reward there for it. There's uh, a political reward and there's financial reward. And getting into the accession process allows you to open all of the uh, um, chapters uh, of the EU law that deal with the kind of problems which um, uh, a country like Bosnia and Herzegovina faces, which includes, uh, obviously, uh, independence of the judiciary um, it, um, and a whole lot of other um, uh, reforms that, that need to be done. Um, is it enough? I mean, I think, you know, fundamentally, the problem of the Western Balkans, as I said, is that you have clientelist systems run by ethnic nationalist parties. Uh, the difference for the Herzegovina is that they're blessed, uh, God, Bosnia and Herzegovina, is they're blessed with three separate clientelist systems run by three separate nationalist parties. Um, and um, two of them don't really want to live with the third one. So it's it's... It's a terribly difficult starting point. On the other hand, the one thing I'd say is, despite all of the threats to secede, the Bosnian Serbs have not actually done that. Um, and I think that there's obviously always a lot of posturing there. I don't think they would have support from Serbia. They might have support from Russia, but I think that Russia is so distracted by its war, uh, its yeah. unsuccessful war so far in Ukraine, um, that they don't have a lot of bandwidth and attention to help the Bosnian Serbs. In this regard, how problematic do you find the fact that uh, Serbia is refusing to fully align with the EU foreign policy uh, priorities? And what should the EU do in this case? So, you know, I think it's exaggerated. Frankly, I don't think it's... I, I'm more concerned about the issues of rule of law, freedom of expression, independence of the judiciary in Serbia... Um, if, if Serbia were to align tomorrow with the EU sanctions, it would be a, a political plus, plus for the EU and a blow, perhaps a small political blow to Russia. It would make, you know, Russia's not going to collapse. It's not shaking in its shoes. Serbia gets 80% of its energy, current, of its gas currently from uh, Russia. And so it, it, it is very dependent, a bit like Hungary is. Um, they're, they're rushing now to try and reduce that dependency, to diversify their sources. This time next year, there will be interconnectors to Bulgaria and to Hungary so that they can get energy from other places. It will make them more independent and easier. So I, I don't think that, I think alignment is, has become a, a symbolic issue rather than a really issue of substance, unless um, Serbia were really acting as a gateway to get, get around sanctions. But I, I don't really see that happening. And we are talking about Serbia and, you know, we have a normalization process between Serbia and Kosovo. And despite the bumpy and challenging uh, process uh, between uh, the two countries with tensions rising frequently, like in the last days, uh, uh, the Kosovo's gov government appears to be willing to apply for EU candidate status. What will the EU uh, reactions be in the light of the fact that five uh, members do not recognize Kosovo and even the visa liberal was postponed until 2024. Yeah, I think it, 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 there's, you can imagine a diplomatic sequence in which 
the two, the two um, Pristina and, and, and uh, Belgrade, would reach a normalization agreement, which will not be a full international recognition. It will be somewhat similar, I think, to what East and West Germany did in 1972, where they established permanent missions. They sort of recognized each other's uh, um, de facto control over their territory and so on. But it, um, it may not actually even help uh, Kosovo to join the United Nations yet. But um, it would be probably enough to budge the, non, the, the, the five European non-recognizers um, towards recognition. And we already have a situation where de facto they accept Kosovo passports. Um, uh, and so you could imagine how that, if that sequence works, then they would apply for their membership. The normalization agreement, which is on the table, would be accepted. And then um, uh, the, the non-recognizers would recognize it'll still be a very long and slow way for Kosovo because it's a long way behind the others. Um, and there would then have to be a screening process and all of that. But um, that, that's the kind of um, po optimistic scenario. The pessimistic scenario is uh, this trouble on the ground gets worse. This is a, um, a Kosovo government, which the, the new party in government, which is more inflexible, more um, uh, determined to achieve its objectives without compromising. Um, and... Uh, you could imagine that they would sort of say, "Well, then we're going to hold elections now. We're not going to get, we will postpone the whole uh, normalization process. And we'll hold elections first, um, and then if they try to hold elections in a situation where the, the Kosovo Serb police have resigned, there are no Kosovo Serb officials or few um, to supervise this. They haven't yet accepted the creation of the association of uh, Kosovo Serb municipalities, which they were supposed to have done years ago. Um, then you could see how things could deteriorate. Um, so that's the ne that's the, the the negative scenario is, um, and how far that can go, I think, is limited by the fact that there is a NATO presence on the ground. There are four thousand NATO troops. There are EU uh, police as well there. I'm not forecasting a great big explosion, but you know, if you wanted to, just 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 for the sake of uh, political fiction, imagine that um, somehow the the the, 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 Wagner, um, the the Russians decided to lend a few fighters from the Wagner Group um, to mix mix things up for the for the Bosnian Serbs, uh, for the sorry Kosovo Serbs. Um, you could easily imagine how things might de degenerate fast. There was shooting this week at Kosovo police. Nobody was injured, nobody was killed. Um, a stun grenade was thrown at EU forces. New Lex, yeah. it, it only takes an accident or two, and uh, pretty soon you're talking about trouble. And, and we are in the end of this interview. We slightly went overboard, but I can ask a question about how optimistic are you uh, for the region in next year, or pessimistic? Um, I, th I think I see the geopolitical imperative um, and the, the region has Europe's attention for the moment. If they blow it, it will be, it's, it's their choice largely. If they blow it, um, then once again, the EU will go back on to sort of autopilot dealing with them in a bureaucratic sort of way. Um, and they will remain uh, a trouble, troubled and troublesome backwater. But um, uh, there is an opportunity there, and it relies on keeping the momentum going, on little steps, new little agreements being announced, little steps. Open Balkan is a potential for one potential. We haven't talked about that, but the mm -hmm. possibility that organizing themselves, um, uh, the, the, the Western Balkan countries can do some more um, economic opening. Uh, and how about the Berlin is, process, which was re uh, yeah, what we need to do is to bring those two together. Yeah, exactly. Also, you you see them going both together. Well, they they need to come. They need to come together at some point. They need to converge. It's important. You know, the good thing about the Open Balkan initiative is that it it's it's owned by the leaders of the region, or at least by some of them, who say we want to do these things for ourselves. So, provided they do the right things, things that actually bring them closer to the EU by reaching EU standards, 
that it's 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 a good idea that they should do it for themselves and it shouldn't all be imposed from outside by Brussels. Paul, thank you very much for talking to Balkans Debrief. Thank you, Ova. And thank you for watching us. You can always follow and be part of our conversation uh, on Twitter by uh, following AC Europe and uh, use the hashtag Balkans Debrief. Mm-hmm.